Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. This is Michael Moret. We're in 1 Kings chapter 10 today, going verse by verse through the entire Bible, as I have been now for over 30 years. We come today to 1 Kings chapter 10, so I would encourage you to get your Bible and follow along with me as I teach it verse by verse. And we'll begin in just a minute. <clears throat> just a reminder to you, though, that you can study 30 years of archive teaching through the Bible at the website, which is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And the good thing is you can study at your pace, at your convenience. You can begin in Genesis and go all the way through the book of Revelation if you want to, or you can study any book of the Bible that you want to study, or any chapter for that matter. Maybe you just want to study the Psalms, or get some wisdom from the book of Proverbs, or study the Gospels, whatever you want to do. It's a smorgasbord of biblical truth found at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And I'd love to hear from you. If the Word of God is a blessing to you, please write me or email me or send me a note or something. I would appreciate it very much. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 10, 1 Kings, verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. This foreign queen heard that Solomon knew the Lord God, knew the, who evidently was the one true God. She heard that God had done great things for Solomon and had given him more wisdom than anyone else who has ever lived. And that's saying an awful lot, but it's true. And as a result, she comes to test the king to see if these things are true. <clears throat> you know, the world sees God most clearly in his people. And they get an accurate picture of God when his people are obedient. Otherwise, if we're not obedient as Christians, the reflection of God is marred and the world is left in the dark concerning what the real God is like. And if we do that, we have dropped the ball. And we can't afford to do that because we've only got one life to live for Jesus. One, one short period of time here on earth before we enter into eternity to serve the Lord by accurately reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ and telling others about him. Verse 2, And she came to Jerusalem <clears throat> with a very great train with camels that bore spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she talked with him of all that was in her heart. An important man, one who so clearly knew the Lord, should be offered gifts in exchange for his divine wisdom. And what a deal for Solomon. What a deal. God gives Solomon wisdom. And then he is honored by the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, for that wisdom. has given all sorts of riches and wealth. But you see, yeah, what a great deal for Solomon. Yeah, what a great deal for you and me, too. I couldn't teach the Bible if it wasn't for God. There, I, I couldn't talk if it wasn't for God. I couldn't think. I couldn't see. I couldn't hear. I couldn't do. And I couldn't breathe. My heart wouldn't beat if it wasn't for God. That's true of all of us. Whatever we can do, whatever skills we have, whatever intelligence we have, whatever abilities we have, come from God. And, and then when we walk in the Spirit and use them in service of God, we get blessed. And, and think about that. We get blessed because God is working through us, and yet we get to experience the blessing 
We not only get to experience the blessing that comes as a result of God working through us, but we get to experience the blessing of fellowshipping with God in the process. It's just a wonderful life. I wouldn't trade life with Jesus for anything in this world. There isn't a sin in this world that's worth robbing me of my time with Jesus. And I know what I'm talking about because I lived 26, 26, my first 26 years were lived as an unsaved man doing the things that unsaved people do. And then for what? I don't know, 36 years? 37 years now I've been saved. I wish I would have got saved when I was 18, when I first heard the gospel. Verse 3. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was not anything hidden from the king, which he told her not. Some of the questions may have been silly. I don't know. Some of them may have been nosy. But it didn't matter. The king took the time and answered every single one of them. And this was an answer to Solomon's prayer because he prayed that God would bless Israel and that people would come from other countries to inquire of the one true God. And this is what happened. So you can bet that Solomon made the most of it. You know, I never, I never turned down an opportunity to minister the word of God if I can possibly help it. And I always feel that whenever I have an opportunity to teach the word to a group or to a church or maybe do someone's funeral or something like that, um, I always look at it as an honor and a privilege. And it doesn't have to be a lot of people. It should be a small group or whatever. It's always, I always look at it as being an honor to be placed in that situation by God to where I can share his word. And everything, everything that happens to us, every situation that we find ourselves in is an opportunity for us to showcase God and to be used by him. <clears throat> no matter what that may be. Verse 4, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the food of his table and the sitting of his servants, and the attendants of the ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his accent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She lost her breath. She was so impressed that it seems as if it didn't even register. Solomon's greatness didn't even register. It's one of those deals where superlatives begin to ring hollow. I mean, you can only see great, fantastic, unbelievable so many times before they become meaningless. But she came to Israel and she saw an abundance of everything good. And everything was operating so orderly and efficiently. That's a sign that the one in charge is walking with the Lord. When you have chaos, I don't care where, you have chaos on a football team, you have chaos on a baseball team, you have chaos in a sports organization, you have chaos at work, you have chaos in the family. When things are not orderly and efficient, there's a spiritual problem there somewhere. Somebody has dropped the ball and most likely it's the leader, whether it's the husband or the father or whatever the case may be. And God was blessing Israel because Israel did not worship the blessing more than the blesser, who is God. When God is number one with his people, God will use something in his people to draw others to himself. And that's what was happening. Verse 6, And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. You know, most of the time when we hear about something that's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. But not in Solomon's case. And that's because God was involved. And that makes all the difference in the world. The Bible says that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we ask, think, or imagine. So he can do more than what somebody can even imagine. When we add God to the mix, nothing is too good to be true.
Verse 7. Howbeit, I believed not the words until I came, and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. I like that, don't you? The half was not told me. I heard it was wonderful. It sounded too good to be true. But the reality is, the half was not told me. It's twice as good as what I was told. And she goes on, Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. The situation with Solomon and Israel was impossible to exaggerate. It was tremendous beyond words. And that's not limited to Solomon's day. Some of the things that God does are beyond description and beyond our ability to take in. And that's okay. We should be in awe of God and we should be in awe of his works. And even if we can't grasp the wonderful things that he does, still thank him. Show him your appreciation. Verse 8. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, who stand continually before thee, and who hear thy wisdom. Kindness, goodness, and righteousness are all offshoots of wisdom. With a man like that in charge, it's easy to see why there was so much happiness. He was good. And consequently, his servants were respectful and loyal. Everything is operating the way it ought to because they're getting marching orders from the head who is God. And when the body is in tune with the head, when the body, the body parts are getting, are getting orders and obeying those orders from the brain and everything is functioning correctly, that body is going to be operating smoothly and there's going to be happiness in that body. And when a people are getting their marching orders from God, or when a human being, is get, just a single person, is getting their marching orders from God, things will be normal, things will be happy, things will be the way they should be. And I'm not saying there won't be problems, but I'm saying in spite of any problems, there will be peace and contentment and joy. Verse 9. Blessed be the Lord thy God, who delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he the king to execute justice and righteousness. Well, it was nice of her to say that. God must really love your people to put you on the throne as king, Solomon. Well, that's nice to hear, isn't it? And she was right. Of course, it was God working through Solomon too. But the queen was smart enough to know that kindness and goodness and righteousness were offshoots of a walk with the Lord. And the queen was smart enough to know that all the good in Israel, including their good king, was a sign of God's presence, was a gift from God. God leaves his mark on many things in this world in order to grab the attention of the lost. That's what he's doing here. He is leaving his mark on Solomon and on the nation of Israel in order to grab the attention of this lost soul, the Queen of Sheba. And you see, those who have a desire for truth recognize those marks of God and they follow them. And they end up coming to God and they end up getting saved. That's why it's so important for a Christian to live for Jesus. To put Jesus first. To live the word of God. To act like Jesus. To let Jesus live through them. To proclaim the word of God. That's why it's so important to let Jesus live his life out through you. And speak through you without watering anything down. You're not going to attract most people. But you will attract those who have a hunger for truth. And they will recognize the one true God. Now you're going to take some heat for doing that because most people aren't interested in truth. Most are not. But that's okay. For the sake of those who are, it's good enough. 
Verse 10. And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. She gave Solomon another three hundred million dollars worth of gold. And long before this day, Psalm 72.15 predicted that Solomon would get, would receive gold from Sheba. And then that came to pass right here. Verse 11. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir a great plenty of almond trees, and precious snow stones. Among trees, among wood, was good for carving. It was used to make musical instruments. So just Solomon and the kingdom of Israel is being lavished with unbelievably precious things, wonderful things, valuable things. Verse 12, And the king made the almond tree pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, harps also, and for the king's house, harps also, and psalteries for singers. There came no such almond trees, nor were seen unto this day. And this wood, you know, was used for fine woodworking. And uh, like I said, it was also used for musical instruments. And one history book says that they made 400,000 instruments with this wood. I mean, that's a lot of orchestras just must have been a wonderful time to live in Israel. Peace, prosperity, fine music, music that glorified God, holiness everywhere. It's just a great, great place. Probably the world has never seen a country like this at this particular time. It was the heyday of Israel. There's no question about it up until this point anyway. And it's because God was leading. Can't go wrong with God leading you. Verse 13, And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Anything she asked for was given to her, a gift from Solomon. These two are trying to outgive each other. It's like Jesus said, Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Queen of Sheba gave abundantly to Solomon. When she didn't walk away a pulper, he turned right around and gave her anything she asked for. And if you give to God, he'll give back to you. You give to his work, he'll give back to you. No, I'm not talking about the word of faith heresy, where you can name it and claim it. I'm not saying that. But you can't outgive God. You give to God. He may not give it back to you in this life. He'll supply all your needs for as long as he wants you to live. And he'll give you great joy and happiness in serving him in peace. And that'll, that'll be worth more than anything in the world. But you can bet that whatever he doesn't give you in, in, uh, in this world, he'll give you in the next. God owes no man anything. He's not in debt to anyone. Verse 13. Actually, verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold, which is about $400 million a year in gold. Came to Solomon every single year, $400 million. That was probably worth more than that, actually. 15. Besides that which he had of the merchantmen, and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia, and of the governors of the country. The wealth was pouring into Solomon, literally pouring into Solomon. There were taxes on items that were imported, plus tribute money from nations around Israel that he was in charge of. The old bank vaults were bursting. No deficit in this government. What a surplus. 16. And King Solomon made 200 bucklers of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one buckler. 
And each of these 200 shields were worth about $120,000. So he had 200 shields worth about $120,000. 17. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went into one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. These 300 small shields were worth over $4 million. I think the Lord is trying to tell us that Solomon was rich, aren't you? Or don't you think that? I mean, but this is beyond rich. This is even beyond extravagant. And yet, it is pathetic when compared to the eternal riches in Christ that we're going to experience forever for living with for him. In heaven, we're going to look at life in Solomon's time and we're going to think, boy, those were rough days compared to now. Just live for Jesus. Just and I'm not again. I'm not talking about gold, but and and stuff like that. I mean, we're going to be walking on gold in heaven. The things that men, gold is something that that men fight over and have wars over here on earth. And we're going to be walking on it in heaven. We're going to be driving on it if we have cars of some sort. So. You know, the kind of riches and wealth are just beyond our ability to grasp. All from living for Jesus in this life. A lot to look forward to. That's why God says, set your sights on things above, not on the things on the earth. Why, if you're a Christian, just live for Jesus in this world. Don't be enamored with this world. Don't think that this world is cool. Don't gather up for yourselves all sorts of wealth in this world. Why? Focus on eternity. Focus on living for Jesus, man. You're going to be lavished with blessings up there. It'll make the, the greatest blessings on earth seem like a garbage heap. Don't forego a wonderful forever because you're in love with this world or the sinful things of this world to the point where, it won't, where, where you won't repent and receive Christ as Lord and say, man, that is about as dumb as you can be. Look at verse 18. This, goes, this description continues. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold, of course. I guess a pure white ivory throne was kind of chintzy by Solomon's standards, so he overlaid it with gold. Ivory overlaid with gold. Solomon sat on gold. That's pretty extravagant. He sat on gold. But like I said, we're going to walk on it in eternity. God is, God is going to use gold for blacktop. Verse 19, where we're going, if we know Christ. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round about behind, was round behind, I'm sorry. And there were arms on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the arms. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other. Upon the six steps, there were not the like made in any kingdom. The lions were symbols of strength. And those symbols of strength warned of the foolishness of even attempting to oppose the rule of Solomon from within or without. And Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, by the way. And that's a sign of his strength and of him being in control as well. Verse 21. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver, which was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. Solomon's silverware and cups and dishes were all gold. And not just in his palace either. His country home, his cottage, you know, his fishing cottage was furnished with gold utensils. That was his hunting shack. Verse 22. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish 
bringing gold and silver, ivory, and apes and peacocks. He built himself a zoo. And we know this from the book of Ecclesiastes too. Look at verse 24. And all the earth consulted Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. People came to talk with Solomon because they wanted to improve themselves. Wisdom and righteousness rubbed off on those who spent time with Solomon. You know, just Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. Who we hang out with rubs off on us. We become like who we hang out with. And that doesn't even necessarily have to be in person. It could be by television, by computer. It's one of the damnable things about watching stuff that you shouldn't watch on television or computer. You become like it. It rubs off on you. It becomes normal without you even realizing it in many cases. And it's the same when you're hanging around good people. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. You hang around with good Christians. You listen to good Christian teaching. You're hanging around with Jesus. You're reading the Bible. You're hanging around with Jesus. How can a young man keep his way pure? By giving heed to your word, O Lord. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why? Because you're spending time with Jesus when you're spending time in the word. And then you become like Je You become like who you hang out with. And people came to talk with Solomon because they wanted to improve themselves. Wisdom and righteousness rubbed off on those who spent time with him. And if that's true about him, how much more is it true concerning the Son of God? You know, the Bible says that as we spend time with Christ, we are changed into his image from one level of glory to another. And people came from all over the world to spend time with Solomon. How blessed are we to be able to open the Creator's book and spend time with the one who is so much greater than Solomon? 25, and they brought every man his present, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, and a certain amount year by year. In that culture, you didn't visit someone without bringing um, them a present of some sort, and they brought Solomon plenty, and he just keeps getting richer, 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. So Solomon was not a man of war, but he was wise, so he knew the best way to keep the peace, at least according to the world, was to be so strong that no one would dare attack, and that's what he was doing. 27, and the king made silver, to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the Shephelah for abundance. Verse 28, And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, and Q, the king's merchants, received them from Q at a price. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver, and in horse for a hundred and fifty. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria, did they bring them out by their means. In other words, up until now, Israel's soldiers were for the most part on foot, but Solomon turned them into horse, horse soldiers. And these horses and chariots, talked about in verse 29, were there to deter attack from the Hittites and the Syrians. And again, the best way to avoid war is to convince any enemy that they can't win if they attack. And I'm out of time. Study the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com at your pace, at your convenience, using the, my audio Bible commentaries, verse by verse, again, from Genesis to Revelation at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. You can be a part of this ministry by giving to this ministry. You can give right there at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click the Donate button and pray. Pray about what God would have you give. That's, again, at thebibleversebyverse.com, and I'm out of time. Until next time, we'll pick it up in Chapter 11. This is Michael Moret. So long, everyone.